because we've always been told, you know, industrial policy aims to say, how do we get competitive in high tech industries, preferably in manufacturing? And, you know, except for professionals like engineers and lawyers and doctors, that kind of shuts out most self-employed people yeah, who don't have those kinds of very high levels of skills that they can compete internationally. So the real question for a country like South Africa is how can we support sectors and industries that where people can generate incomes through employment and self-employment and which are sustainable, but they may never be internationally competitive. And how do we think about industrial policy as supporting those kinds of industries and that kind, those kinds of production? So some of the things we could look at is really large-scale promotion of more labor-intensive industries, even if we know they're only going to meet domestic and regional needs for the foreseeable future. So the idea that we can only support export industries cuts out huge swathes of the economy that are protected primarily by distance from other countries or because there's services where you need to have personal services um, supplied directly and trade in them is, is possible, but still quite difficult for many of them. You know, that would really mean we'd have to fundamentally redirect ind industrial policy from where we are now. So we always talk about labor intensive sectors. We never really talk about what that would mean. And can we actually compete in those sectors internationally, um, given latecomer status in, in particular? But what could we do in terms of labor intensive sectors that would generate livelihoods, for, but focus mostly on local and domestic markets. Um, and that's really talking about extensive growth, which is extensive growth is when you grow by pulling in more resources rather than by raising efficiency. So your output grows because more people are employed, but also more other resources may be employed rather than just by increasing efficiency. And to be clear, so we don't get into like technical arguments, of course, everything is on a spectrum. If you're taking somebody who's unemployed and helping them to produce anything at all, their productivity goes up. But what it does mean is we can't just say we're only going to grow by competing with cutting edge technologies at the global level, um, because that automatically excludes most people who are unemployed for the foreseeable future. Unless you can absolutely hit it lucky and find something that you can export faster than, it, than we've been able to to date. It would also mean that we have to find ways to expand demand for small producers so that you gradually get into a virtuous cycle where you have more equitable incomes, more equitable demand, and that in itself will make it easier for small business to grow. So we could have programs to subsidize necessities for working class communities, um, you know, like we do through things like school feeding systems and solar, but it would have and solar geysers that we did a few years ago. And in fact, most government infrastructure, but it would have to be on a much larger scale if we really want to step up demand for small businesses. As we all know, we could say, how can we transfer, transform procurement by government agencies, big business and formal retail, set, um, retail chains? But just to flag, most of the localization by government has actually not been focused on consumables and light industry products that small business could produce tended to focus on the big heavy capital equipment, which largely excludes small business in practice. Um, we could say, how could we make it easier for small businesses to access customers by ensuring that they have access to things like formal retail sites, taxi banks, um, government institutions like schools and hospitals, construction and other business sites on a much more consistent level. So when I say Access to, to business sites, that's largely things like catering and other consumables that workers might buy from them right there. Um, and then how can we then also ensure that we meet the needs of actual and potential entrepreneurs for resources, but it kind of often has to be holistic. So if you give people finance, but they don't have the skills and education to use it, they're just going to end up in debt. It's always been easier for government to talk about finance and skills, but not about things like infrastructure, industrial sites, and all of those things. So the question would be, how can we really give people more access to all of these resources? And I have to say, probably the hardest one is, is fixing the education system. But if we, as I think you could see from the second slide, and you'll see it in more detail in the REB itself, um, there is such a correlation between having a degree and being and being in the formal small business sector. Um, 
the only other place that has people with degrees at such an extent is in the um, is in government where you've got the big public services. And then finally, obviously, in the short run, if we don't do something about load shedding, all of this is kind of pointless. That we need some way to say if, if the national grid will only be fixed in a couple of years, what can we do to mitigate the impact on small business by helping them get inverters, by helping them go off grid through solar or generators, um, by helping them get more efficient equipment? There are some programs in place to do that at the DTIC, but they're still pretty small. And they're obviously only geared toward the formal sector.